Okay. So, uh, great to see you all again here. Uh, so, I'll start with a review. We first described the two half BPS uh, sectors of N equals, uh, N equals two superconformal field theories. Uh, that was the first uh, lecture um, where we had the, the Higgs branch operators about which I did not say anything, but uh, Balt is giving you a whole course about it. And then there are Coulomb branch lectures. Coulomb branch operators, and uh, these are the lectures I'm giving. So uh, there is a slight, I mean, I just wanted to make a, a small, clear, distinct, a, a clear, to make a clear the distinction between the various things that are known about these two sectors. So in Lagrangian theories, this is a coupling constant independent. So this is independent of uh, the coupling constant. So in uh, theories which have a Lagrangian, this can be determined at a tree level. But for theories that, have n that are non-Lagrangian, uh, there are these uh, techniques that Balt is teaching you. And there has been a, a fantastic progress on these this, uh, non-Lagrangian techniques. So this is for non-Lagrangian techniques. Now for Coulomb branch operators, there is already a lot of stuff to be said for Lagrangian theories. So since there is a dependence on the Young-Mills coupling and the theta angle, so the structure constants, the OP coefficients depend on those uh, parameters in some normalization. And so there is already a lot to be said for Lagrangian theories. But for non-Lagrangian theories, uh, at least at the moment, there hasn't been much uh, analytical progress. It's mostly uh, some, there are some bootstrap results, however, by uh, essentially the Hamburg group that uh, I'll give more references to uh, at the end. So, so, that's, so I'm more or less focusing on this, the, Lagrangian, uh, the, the perturbative or Lagrangian aspects of Coulomb branch operators. And Balt is focusing, I guess, mostly on the non-Lagrangian general properties of Higgs branch operators. So this is uh, uh, what the different strands of developments are. So, uh, so we discussed those two sectors. And uh, yeah, then we derive this uh, relation between the force sphere partition function and uh, the Keller potential in theory space, and the Keller potential in and the Keller potential in theory space can also be related to the two-point function in flat space of uh, marginal operators. Let me write this again. So if the operator O i has dimension two then it corresponds to an exactly marginal deformation of the theory. And the two-point function OI, OJ dagger uh, captures the zamologic of metric as a function of the couplings. And we have seen that, uh, well, this is a flat space observable. So this is measured in R4. So we have seen that uh, the force sphere partition function captures the Keller potential, which is the, which is the, the which is related to the metric by uh, taking two derivatives. So there is a direct relation between this ex particular extremal correlator and the force sphere partition function. So today we'll study, uh, I'll study in detail the case of SU2 gauge group. And we'll study the perturbative properties of uh, these extremal correlators. We'll study the chiral ring. And then I'll, uh, I'll also show you how to solve the general, the general extremal correlator, not just this particular extremal correlators. So I'll do the most general case, and we'll discuss connections to uh, general aspects of a perturbative series in quantum field theory, namely resurgence. So this is the, are there any questions about the previous, uh, whatever is unclear about the previous lectures, maybe I can start by addressing that. If there is anything, OK. So I'll proceed. So today we do SU2 gauge theory. Uh, Superconformal SU2 gauge theories. Uh, so there are two interesting Lagrangian theories with just one uh, SU2 gauge group. Uh, so we'll discuss these two theories in parallel and compare them to each other. The first, the first such theory is a SU2 gauge group with an adjoint hypermultiplet. 
adjoint hyper, massless adjoint hyper multiplet. This theory has another name. Does anybody know that the name of that theory? Second, this is a massless adjoint hyper. Very good. So this is the n equals four maximally supersymmetric Young Mills theory. That's our first example. So this has an exactly marginal parameter, uh, which is G and Milson theta for the SU2 gauge group, with theta being 2 pi periodic. Then there is another theory, which does not have n equals 4 supersymmetry. So it's a genuine n equals 2. Uh, so you take SU2 gauge theory, and you add four hypers uh, in the fundamental representation. This has only, this is again parameterized by the Young Mills coupling and the theta angle. So this is again the same story. But this does not have n equals 4 supersymmetry. So it's a genuine n equals 2 supersymmetric theory. So let's start by describing the chiral ring in those cases. So Coulomb branch operators, chiral ring or Coulomb branch operators. So the, it's easy to convince you, yourself this you can take as a small exercise if you want to get a little bit deeper into the subject and you know, uh, familiarize your, yourself with these Lagrangians. Uh, familiar, familiarize yourself with these Lagrangians and uh, the transformation rules under supersymmetry. You can, uh, you can show that the following is a chiral ring operator. Coulomb branch operator, where phi is the scalar in the vector multiplet. Scalar in the vector multiplet. So phi is in the adjoint representation of SU2. So phi is, is in the adjoint of SU2. So since it's in the adjoint of SU2, you cannot take a trace of just phi. That would just be vanishing because it's an SU2 matrix, so it's traceless. But you can take the trace of phi squared. So I'll denote this operator by uh, phi 2. I'll denote this operator by phi 2. And then I'll put also minus 4 pi i for future convenience. So this is one uh, chiral ring operator. And you can argue that, well, this is true in both examples. So this is the chiral ring operator, both in this theory and in this theory. You can argue that the chiral ring uh, is spent the chiral ring, as I mentioned, is finitely and freely generated. So the chiral ring is uh, spent or generated, but well, is given by uh, powers of this guy. So I'll define these operators O n to conform with the previous notation uh, as phi two uh, to the power uh, n. So this is the whole chiral ring of this theory. The dimension of phi, the dimension of O n, is going to be two n. All right. So in particular, the O one, in particular O one, is the operator that uh, generates the dependence on the cup. Well, this is the operator that corresponds to changing the coupling constants. So this is exactly the exact. This is the exactly marginal operator. So this is the exactly marginal operator, and its coefficient is tau. If we add O to the action in this fashion, then the coefficient is tau, or tau is four pi squared over g angle squared with an i plus theta over two pi. Okay. So O1 has a special role in this game. It's the coupling constant, essentially. Now, so the chiral ring in this, so the chiral ring in this model is especially simple. The algebra of the chiral ring is uh, in this convention and in this normalization, uh, the algebra of the chiral ring is simply that. 
and it's independent of the coupling constant. The coupling constant dependence is in the two-point functions. You could have normalized these operators canonically, and then the dependence on the coupling constant would have been here in the algebra of the operators. But uh, you can also just normalize these coefficients to be 1, which is convenient. And then the coupling constant dependence is in the two-point function, which is a function of tau and tau bar. So determining the chiral ring in this SU2 gauge theories is equivalent to finding these functions g to n. If you know all these two-point functions, then you, can, uh, then you can solve for any extremal correlator. Indeed, let's do it. So let's suppose we have an extremal correlator on1 at x1, on2 at x2, all the way to, let's say, onk at xk. And then we have O dagger at, of n1 plus n2 all the way to nk. So this is what we define to be an extremal correlator, if you recall. So given this product rule and given these two-point functions, it's uh, obvious what to do. This is just g. You just collapse these guys, and you get g two n one ta 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 plus n k, uh, which is a function of tau and tau bar. So if we knew these two-point functions, if somebody just gave, handed us these two-point functions in this normalization, we would be done. So we would have all the extremal correlators, and I could even put this guy at y. If you want, let's be even more fancy. Let's put this guy at y. Then we will have this uh, factor that we discussed many times. y minus xi to the power 2 delta i. And delta i is 2nk. So it's 4nk. Uh, uh, and this is k. 4ni. This is i, and i goes from 1 to k. So you can even be more fancy. So we could compute all the extremal correlators in this series if we just knew the g's. And that's our goal for today, to find these g's uh, non-perturbatively, hopefully, and, um, and then see what we learn from that. Are there any questions? This is the setup for today. So we want us to compute g's in both uh, SU2 gauge theory with four hypers and SU2 gauge theory with a not joint hyper. And then we'll do some resurgence analysis and, uh, and uh, make connection with TT star geometry and Toda equations. Are there any questions about the setup? Anything that's unclear before I start? OK, very good. So the central result, oh, I should say that in this convention that I've defined here, uh, G0 is given by 1, obviously. So it's just 1. G0 is just 1, and O0 is just 1. OK, so these are, just the, con these are the conventions that I'm using. So yesterday, we gave a prescription, or I gave you the outline of a proof for how to compute G2. I didn't yet tell you how to compute the general GNs. But yesterday, we learned, we learned how to compute G2 as a function of tau and tau bar. So this is the Zama logic of metric uh, in these two theories. And we discussed the fact that this G G2 is the Zama logic of metric on the space of these theories. So the key formula was the G2 as a function of tau and tau bar is 16 times um, 1 over the four sphere partition function squared times the determinant of the four sphere partition function, the derivative with respect to tau of the four sphere partition function, the derivative with respect to tau bar, and the second derivative of the four sphere partition function with respect to tau and tau bar. What is this? Oh, there is no 60. Let me just get the normalization straight. I would hate to get it wrong now, and then it will. Uh. 
Yeah, I think it, there is a 16. Another, another formula that's equivalent, that was the homework exercise, was to uh, express this as a derivative of the logarithm of z. Uh, that was an equivalent formula. OK. So now uh, we, can, we, can, we can proceed. We can at least uh, start from G2, see what are the properties of G2, and then we'll generalize to, the most, to, to, to all the other extremal correlators. So let's, uh, let's do it. So let's uh, compute. Let's start computing something now. Uh, after all this uh, uh, general introduction. So I'll, st I'll start from, uh, let's, well, I'll give you both, both cases in parallel. We'll do both cases in parallel. So for SU2 with an adjoint hyper, also known as n equals 4 super Yagmills theory, uh, the force here partition function is a, a very simple. It's the integral of some real variable a from minus infinity to plus infinity of e to the minus 4 pi imaginary part of tau. So the imaginary part of tau, uh, as you can see from here, is essentially 1 over the yang mills coupling. So 4 pi imaginary type a squared. And then there is 2a squared uh, for normalization. That, that's the uh, SU2 with adjoint hyper. And for SU2 with the uh, four flavors, four fundamental hypers, uh, four fundamental hypers, uh, the formula is uh, significantly more complicated, as uh, many of you know. But it's still explicit. So it's still an integral for over dA from minus infinity to plus infinity. And then there is the same e to the minus 4 pi imaginary tau a squared. And then there is the same normalization factor to a squared. But then there is a, a bunch of uh, a few special functions that I think that somebody must have uh, talked about. So I'm not going to review them here. Uh, So there is a bunch of special, well, sorry, this is to the 4. And then uh, there is the instant on, the instant on factor that's also known explicitly, which you need to raise to, which you need to take the absolute value of and take uh, the second, and then uh, raise to the second power. So H are some, H, uh, the H's are some special functions that are explicitly known, but I'm sure there was somebody who, uh, Talked about the S4 yeah, partition we'll function. <laughs> okay, so you 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 should know that. I'm not going to review that. I'm just going to uh, use that to to solve the ex the extremal correlators. Okay, so given these formulas, we can now uh, just uh, compute, right? Uh, given this and given that, we can just compute uh, the two-point functions. For in the so in the first in the first case. Let's uh, do the first case first. The first case, SU2 plus an adjoint hyper, we find, uh, well, this uh, matrix integral, uh, well, this integral is trivial to do. And what we find is the G2 is a, I have some funny normalization, but it's actually a kind of canonical. So it's independent of the theta angle. That's a surprise number one, perhaps. And, and it's just quadratic in the young wheels coupling, and that's it. So the coupling constant dependence in n equals 4 is trivial. Um, and, and that's it. So this is exact. This uh, will soon be, I'll soon connect this result to what we saw about extremal correlators in n equals 4 in the first lecture. This is essentially saying that only the tree level diagrams contribute to the zamologic of metric. So it has the same content as what we discussed before. In the second example, G2 is much more interesting. So the tree level contribution is the same. Uh, and you might not be surprised by that. Because it's the same tree level diagram for the adjoint scalar. It's the same, it's the same operator. So at tree level, you get the same answer. But uh, then there is a series of corrections which are perturbative in nature. So let me just write down the few uh, next corrections. And they contain the zeta function with like odd arguments. And then there is 1 over the imaginary part of tau to the power 4. So this is like g and mills to the power 8, I think, in my convention. Mm. 
Okay. And then there is a 1,500. I'm not going to write all the terms, just the first few ones. Uh, 4 pi cubed. Then there is 1 over the imaginary part of tau to the power 5. And so on. So these are perturbative corrections. So you could uh, reproduce these corrections from diagrams. So the first diagram looks like this. It's uh, essentially a tree level diagram. But then there are diagrams that look like this. And so on. There are many diagrams. So you can uh, reproduce these uh, results from a, a, an explicit perturbative computation. So these are perturbative corrections, but there are also instanton corrections. And uh, amazingly, we actually know them. So for example, the first instanton correction depends on the theta angle. So while in n equals 4, there is, there is no dependence on the theta angle because there are no instantons for this observable. This does receive instanton correction. So there is some dependence on the theta angle. And there is your typical instanton factor that you like. And then there is some uh, perturbative series, like 6 over imaginary tau squared, 3 over pi, 1 over imaginary tau cubed, and so on. So the structure here is basically that there is the perturbative series, and then there are instanton factors. But if each instanton factor is also addressed by a perturbative series. So and that's, yep. Say again? Can you do it exactly the perturbative part by residual? So the question is if I can uh, do the perturbative part exactly. I could probably write it as a sum over infinitely many poles. Is that considered exact? Well, if it's combined to the good function, I, I'm asking. I don't know. We did it like uh, monkeys, just uh, expanding it. Yeah. But maybe there is a nice way to resum it. So, so this. So let me now tell you what it means, what this, all, all of this thing, what, what this means. This is a very interesting, uh, in some sense, dual, two dual interpretations. So there are some resurgence aspects about it, which I'm going to discuss soon. But first, I want to tell you what it means uh, for geometry. And so the space of theories, in both cases, is spent by the young mills coupling and the theta angle. And in both cases, there is an S-duality group that acts on these two parameters. So in fact, the space of indistinguishable theories is in the fundamental domain. Hmm? Well, I'll discuss that soon, just a second. The space of, indis the the space of distinguishable theories is in this fundamental domain, OK? So both cases describe, uh, in both cases, the exactly marginal parameters lead to to a conformal manifold that looks like the fundamental domain. So since this G2 is interpreted as the Zamalachik of metric, so we basically, we should interpret these two formulas as the dif different, different metrics that we can put on the upper half plane, mod SL2Z, namely on the fundamental domain. So in the first case, the metric, the Zamalachik of metric is going to be given by simply this times uh, times a, a DG and Mills uh, squared, uh, which is like the, met the, the line element. Or if you write, write it more, if you want to write it a little bit more precisely, you get d tau, d tau bar, which is uh, the upper half, well, the coordinates on the upper half plane. And then we get 6 over imaginary tau squared. So this is the metric that we induce on the, the, the fundamental domain domain from the physics of n equals 4 super Young Mills theory. This is a familiar matrix, right? So how is it called? What is this space? Hmm? This is a constant curvature metric, which is normally uh, put on the upper half plane, hyperbolic, hyperbolic upper half plane. So this is the Poincaré disk. Uh, Poincaré disk. So it's a constant curvature uh, metric. So we see that in n equals 4, the metric on the, on the space of theories does not receive any corrections beyond the tree level diagram. And you get a constant curvature metric, negative constant curvature metric. In the second case, we see that the metric receives corrections, both perturbative and non-perturbative. So in the second case, uh, the metric receives corrections. It does start from this piece, which is the dominant piece 
near weak up. So weak coupling in this picture is very far up. So very far up, the metric that is induced by uh, SU2 with four, with four hypers coincides with that metric. But there are, of course, these corrections, perturbative as well as non-perturbative corrections in the coordinates on the upper half plane. So this is like a, another metric. It's not uh, your canonical metric. And it does not have constant curvature. Uh, but it does have something in common with that metric. So first of all, it's probably true that the volume is finite. The volume of this disk with this metric is finite. This is an exercise. You can, uh, you can try to show that using this metric, the volume of the fundamental domain is finite. This property remains, to be true, remains true also for the metric that's induced by the other, by, the, by SU2 with four hypers in the fundamental representation. And secondly, there is a weak coupling is at infinite distance away logarithmically. So weak coupling is uh, logarithmically far away. It is uh, logarithmically far away, infinitely far away. And the distance diverges logarithmically, which is obvious from here. If you take this line element and you just go straight up, it diverges logarithmically. But the volume remains finite. So a weak coupling is like an infinite throat, an infinite, very narrow throat. So the total volume is finite, but uh, the distance is infinite. So while this is a non-standard metric, and I mean, it's, it, it, it has some properties which are uh, similar to the n equals 4 uh, metric. So this is the zamalogic of metric interpretation of these results. But then there is another way to interpret these results in the language of uh, AGT. So uh, AGT allows for a different interpretation for this, of these computations. So in AGT, you can think about SU2 with four hypers as arising from compactifying some six-dimensional theory on a sphere with punctures. So this, let's start from the second case. The second case is the sphere with four punctures. So the interpretation of this formula in AGT is that it's uh, in, uh, you might think about it as the zamalogic of metric on the space of theories, but uh, you can also think about it as, the, as a metric on the space of spheres with four punctures. Because uh, the coupling constant G and Mills comma theta uh, is associated to the location of these four punctures. So this space is also one complex dimensional. The space of, four, the space of spheres with four punctures modulo SL2R is also one complex modulo SL2C is also one complex dimensional. And this metric can be interpreted as a metric on this space. And in this case, you can think about it as a Teich-Muller uh, metric. So it's a non-standard metric on some uh, space of Riemann surfaces. It's different from the Weil-Peterson metric. So it's not the same as the classical, uh, classical Weil-Peterson metric on this space. So you can think about it, this computation as uh, yeah, furnishing some interesting new metric on a type Muller space. And in the first case, uh, the way you construct n equals 4 super young Mills theory from uh, six dimensions is just a torus with some uh, marked point. And uh, in this case, you get the standard metric on that uh, space of tori. So n equals 4 theory gives the standard wild peterson metric. So this is an, so there are several parallel ways to think about the, uh, these computations. Now I want to make some contact. Are there any questions about this? Yep. Uh, n equals four is constructed from six dimensions by compactifying on a torus. So one way. So this also has the one complex dimensional moduli space, and you can think about this as parameterizing G and Nielsen theta in n equals four. So this metric can be interpreted as the metric on the space of Mark Tori. And in this case, the, this metric can also be interpreted as the metric on the space of sphere, spheres with four punctures. Or in the zamalogic of language, you interpret them both as the metric on the upper half plane, on the, on, the, on the fundamental domain. So there are several different interpretations. Yeah. What is not written? No, this comment is not written anywhere. 
But you can think about it as a, yeah, a new metric on the Teichmuller space. It's like a quantization of the standard Wild Peterson metric. It's a quantum version of the standard metric. Shouldn't it be the metric on the complex structure of the double cover of this uh, thing? Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. Which is a torus and complex the space of fixed complex structure. You're probably right that I might need to take some covers of the, of the Teichmuller space. You're probably right. Yeah, the tech Miller space of a double cover of the surface. You're probably right that I need to do that. Thanks for the comment. <laughs> hmm? What is the mark of on the post? It's just like uh, the way that n equals 4 arises in the HT correspondence. I'm not going to review, of course, this thing. I'm just saying that this is a possible interpretation of these computations, which is complementary to, to the interpretation as a Zamalachikov metric. OK. Are there any more questions about these uh, aspects? Now I'm going to describe some uh, connections to QCD. Analogies, connections. Connection to resurgence and QCD. Say again. Oh, that's a great question. So one of the things that you would like this metric to obey, so the question is whether there is a, con I can see that it's consistent with S duality. So one of the things, one of the things that this metric has to obey is that it would be a good function on the fundamental domain, or it could be invariant under SL to Z. Yeah. So <coughs> you remember that yesterday we discussed the fact that the partition function on the fourth sphere is not well defined because of a counter term. So suppose you try to take this formula and you ask, is it invariant under SL to Z? It turns out that it's not, but it's only non-invariant up to a holomorphic function. Can you answer it in No. I don't know how to see it directly. But it's uh, supposed to be true. It's supposed to be true. Uh, so for example, you can, this you can do directly. In this case, you can see that the four sphere partition function is not invariant under SL to Z, <coughs> but it's invariant up to a holomorphic function. So that nicely ties with what we discussed yesterday, that in fact, uh, there is a counter term. And when we compute G2, this goes away. So uh, by the time that you compute the metric on theory space, it should indeed be invariant under SL to Z. But I don't know how to see it exa explicitly here. I've never seen like anybody showing that. Is it a function or is it something? Is it modular form? What do you expect? The four sphere partition function transforms like a bundle of L times L star, a section of L times L star. So uh, the, this is not invariant. But by the time that I do this procedure with the determinant, it's good. So you can show that this uh, prescription with the determinant is, 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 is a scalar function. It's not a section of L times L star. This is why this is a good formula. But I'm asking from point of modular properties, do you expect this transform as a modular function or how? Ah. Um, Let me say why I'm asking. So written wrote in 95. Yes, I know what you mean. Uh, it's transform as a modular function. Yes. Like yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, well, here, if you do a, an S transformation, you pick up, um, yeah, if you do a, an S transformation, you pick up some holomorphic function, and you can compute it explicitly here. So I can, I can actually, uh, I can actually do it right away. I can do it uh, in real time. So, so I can do it in real time. So, um, so this formula, uh, let me just make an aside uh, to address Maxim's question about whether it's a modular function or not. So the logarithm of the four sphere partition function in the first case, uh, I can, we can do it in real time. It's going to be a logarithm of tau minus tau bar. So if we do a, an S transformation, let's apply an S transformation. So we get log of 1 over tau minus 1 over tau bar. But this is the same as log of tau minus tau bar up to a holomorphic plus anti-holomorphic function. You see? I, I mean, I'm missing signs, but I don't care now. So, it's, so once you do an S transformation, the partition function will pick up a holomorphic plus an anti-holomorphic piece. 
So the transformation under S tra under so this would go away when I take the determinants. So I what I'm doing is okay, but the force field partition function itself is only invariant up to a counter term. And the same is true for Witten's 95 paper, or the Donaldson Witten twist. But is it generic feature for all details of these things will depend on the theory? Ah, there is an interesting question of whether the holomorphic function is, is dependent on the theory or not, and I have no idea. Because I think they were making claims that it depends on topology only, I mean, of pretty general data. No, that's a different question. There is a question of whether it depends on the theory, and there is a question of whether it depends on the manifold. So here it's a fixed manifold, so the second question doesn't arise. So you're asking if it, is, it depends on the theory, and I have no idea. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that. OK, so are there any questions about this? Now I'm moving to start making some connection with resurgence theory and, um, and QCD. So it is, it is typically expected in theories with a small coupling constant that the expansion would morally look like what we got, that there will be a perturbative series. And on top of the perturbative series, there will be an inst instant on corrections. And each instant on correction would be uh, dressed up with a perturbative series of its own. So for any quantity, let's say a Q, you expect some expansion in lambda, and then some instantons which are addressed by some expansion in lambda, and so on. So this is the general structure that's expected in any theory. And it, it, it coincides with, uh, with the, the structure that we find in this case. So now I'll tell you about some old uh, conjectures about the resurgence theory. And we can test them here. So there are all there are all the there are conjectures about properties of a perturbative uh, series series from the 70s and 80s. So first and also from before, there is the Dyson uh, argument. Dyson made Dyson wrote a very nice paper in the 50s, I think, where he argued that uh, the coefficients of any reasonable perturbative series. So let's call this A1, this is A2, and so on. So Dyson argued uh, a half a century ago or more that in absolute value, this has to be more or less n. Uh, the arguments of Dyson have to do with some instability if you reverse the sign of the coupling. But you can also understand this factorial growth of the coefficients from the fact that the number of Feynman diagrams proliferates very fast. So there are of the order of n factorial Feynman diagrams at order n in perturbation theory. So to show you that these supersymmetric theories are not like, so the amazing thing about these computations is that on the, on the one hand, we can do them exactly. On the other hand, they obey all the standard rules from perturbative quantum field theory. So this perturb from the point of view of just perturbative quantum field theory, this is obeyed. So I'll show you even more, something even more stringent soon. So, this, uh, so the number of Feynman diagrams does grow factorially in this computation. So it does obey the standard rules of perturbative series in quantum field theory. So you can check that this is true asymptotically for this perturbative series. The second conjecture is a uh, more recent. It's, uh, it's a Brodsky, a Carliner, and several other people people were involved in this thing. And they have a more sophisticated uh, criterion that is supposed to be true always. But uh, I think this is the only case where you can actually check it in four dimensions. So that's nice. So they are saying the following thing. Suppose you knew the, the n first n loops. So you were very diligent and studious, and you computed the first n loops of some perturbative expansion. Let's say that n is even. For what I'm going to say, it's going to be important. There is some modification when n is odd. So then uh, the procedure is the following. There is something that's called the Pade approximation, where what you do is you construct a rational function uh, in the coupling constant that uh, has a numerator of degree on over n over 2. That's why I want n to be even. So you construct a rational functions with some coefficient ci of degree on n over 2. And you construct some rational function in the denominator 
not a polynomial function in the denominator of degree 1 over 2. And you, 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 you solve for the coefficients ci and di by requiring that, that they reproduce exactly the end loops that you computed analytically. But once you have this expression, you can now make uh, predictions for the coefficient of the n, n plus 1 term. So this makes a prediction. This makes a prediction for a n plus 1. Is this clear? This is called the Padilla approximation. The CI and the DI are determined by matching the first n uh, terms that you've already computed. The CIs are the coefficients of the polynomial in the numerator, and the DIs are the coefficients of the polynomial in the denominator. The ratio is a rational function. Uh, which is called the, the, Pade approxima, the Pade approximation to the perturbative series. And it's called the symmetric Pade approximation. It's called symmetric because the degree, so in the literature, this would be called the n over 2, n over 2 Pade approximation, because the degree of the polynomial in the numerator and the denominator is the same. For some experimental reasons, empirical reasons, it seems that the best Pade approximations are, are of this sort, where the degree of the new, it's, uh, it's voodoo, but it seems to work the best. So, uh, so once you construct this rational function as an approximation to the perturbative series, you can ask, how is my result for a n plus 1 different from the actual result? So this was important in the 80s because people wanted to compute the beta function at like 4, 5, 6 loops of QCD because they wanted to make ever, ever more precise comparisons with deep inelastic scattering. So people, people who are lazy don't want to compute the 6 loop. So they want, OK, we have the first 4 loops. Let's just guess the 6 loop. So that's where it comes from. So the conjecture is that in any quantum field theory, uh, the coefficient of the n plus 1 term that you get from the Padé approximation divided by the coefficient of the n plus 1 term that is actually correct, minus 1, approaches exponentially fast uh, to the right answer, where c is some positive coefficient and sigma is some positive coefficient. And this is asymptotically true. This is supposed to be asymptotically true. OK? So the idea is that you're making only an exponentially small error uh, for high orders in perturbation theory if you use Pade, a symmetric Pade approximation. So using this, uh, I think that using these results, you can uh, test these ideas in four dimensions now. So you can plot, for example, here would be n, and here would be the precision. So here, so the the vertical axis is this combination. So it's, let's say, 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 30, 10 to the minus 40. And this is n. So we just uh, plotted the, on the vertical axis this combination in absolute value, and on the horizontal axis the order in perturbation theory. And we went to more or less order 100. We did not prove that this is true analytically, but we went to more or less order 100, which you can do uh, using uh, these explicit expressions. And it falls on a beautiful straight line with sigma, which is 0.7. And amazingly, uh, in QCD, they found a similar value. So amazingly, in QCD, how much is log 2? Log 2 is uh, like 0.71, right? 0.72. So in QCD, people believe that sigma is around log 2. So it's a very similar value. Yeah. So people in QCD uh, estimated that sigma might be somewhere around, around log 2. So the, so the value of sigma depends on the observable you're talking about? Or? Well, we did a lot of tests of this sort, and it seems to be always around 0.7. We have like around 10 different tests. So it seems to slightly depend. Maybe some theories it's 0 0.71, 0 0.72, but it's always around 0.7. I don't know why. <coughs> uh, we tested many extremal correlators, and uh, it was always like that. So you can do many other checks of this sort, but we haven't, done, we haven't exhausted this, of course. Then there is another question about perturbative series that uh, is, uh, of course, uh, co very commonplace nowadays which is given that there is such a factorial growth of the coefficients, what, is a, what can we say about the convergence of the perturbative series? 
So we have the perturbative series in the zero instanton sector, then we have a perturbative series in the instant in the one instanton sector. So the question is about what about Borel summability? So as you know, for uh, power series that diverge in such a fashion, there is a formal procedure which is called the Borel transform to render those uh, uh, perturbative expansions more manageable. And the idea is that perhaps these uh, expansions are Borel summable. So here, we actually were able to prove that the answer is yes. For all the observables we considered, in the, even in the non-trivial instanton sectors, like even the perturbative expansions in the instanton sectors, uh, this series turned out to be Borel summable, but they're not summable by ordinary, by ordinary series expansion. So they're Borel summable, and there are some poles on the negative Borel axis, uh, which uh, have not been properly, we've not been uh, studied yet. So th nobody knows what they mean. So there are some poles on the negative Borel axis that would be nice to understand what they mean. So they. Do you know the position? Like, uh, I don't remember them. I see. So you don't see that they don't want to. So in QCD, people are in some QCD, in, in the QCD there is an everlasting debate about poles on the positive Borel axis that would make the power series not even Borel summable. Oh, I see. Sorry, you're about negative. But then, so Borel summability is disturbed by is if you have poles on the positive Borel axis, then you cannot even Borel sum the series. But this is this is called renormalance, renormalance, and they may or may not exist. It's really the, the jury is out. As Eliezer told me to say, the jury is out. Not the verdict is not out. So the jury is out about those in QCD. It's like a, this, they have to do probably with some infrared uh, non-safe observables. That's my belief. Anyway, it's, it may not be a substantiated belief. But here in the supersymmetric theories, we find poles on the, only on the negative Borel axis. So in fact, it's Borel summable. But the meaning of those is not clear yet. They have to do, these are in, in the QCD literature, you interpret these poles on the negative axis as uh, having to do with instantons. So it's like saying that, let's say that you have just the perturbative series. So it's not Borel summable. The perturbative series, sorry. Suppose you have just the, per, the perturbative series. It's not summable. So the idea is that that means that you're missing some instantons. So the poles on this negative axis have to do with instantons. And therefore, it should be true that the poles on the negative axis have something to do with the instanton corrections. So there might be some recursion relation where we can get the instanton corrections in the necros of partition function from the zero instanton sector. Because those guys should be able to teach us about the instanton corrections. So there should be some kind of resurgence equation. I see. So you say it's that that's going to be instanton, not like a complex. Uh, it could be also a complex saddle. I, I, I simply don't know. But the ordinary interpretation of poles on the negative Borel axis is that they have to do with instantons that you need to add. And since we already know what the instantons are, it might be that that means that there is some recursion relation on the necros of partition function. OK, so this is, uh, so surprisingly, many of these uh, bold conjectures about QCD uh, turn out to be an analytically correct uh, for, for no, no good reason, as far as I'm con I can say. So what, what, what was the motiv original motivation for that conjecture? The original motivation is the laziness of people. They did not want to co go to six order. They wanted to guess the six right. order from a rational function. So it, was a wishful thinking, it was wishful thinking based on the, I mean, y the, there is lots of observables in QCD that are computed to four loops. Right. And it seemed that, you know, if you know the first three loops, then the first loop is kind of close to the, uh, the approximation. So then they wrote this uh, conjecture. This, uh, where was it? Yeah, that conjecture. OK, uh, should we take, uh, at what point should we take a break? Like no, for just five minutes? But any time is fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be fixed time. So. OK, if there, let's say if there are more questions, I can take them now, and then we can take like a 10 minutes long break. And we'll finish the extremal correlators after the break. Uh, or I can just uh, spend some time giving references. Uh, are there any questions now? Or maybe I'll spend like five minutes giving references now. Because oh, okay, I got a few. I got a few emails and a few people asked me about references, so I prepared a list of references uh, for everything that I'm saying. Uh, so I'll just spend five minutes giving you all the references.
in an orderly fashion, and then we'll take a break. So I'll divide the references by topics. So derivations of uh, z equals e to the minus k of this business. This you can find in two papers uh, di from two different points of view. Uh, so 0, 8, 5, 1, 1. This is from the supersymmetric point of view, uh, of the, the, a point of view which is more suitable for supersymmetric localization. And this is from the point of view that I explained, the point of view of trace anomaly. So this is about z to the e to minus k. The extremal correlators, which is the subject of the next hour, cor extremal correlators, which is the subject of the next hour, you can find in, in, uh, in this paper. Now, people ask me also over email about global properties of trace anomalies. So people are like, what can we say about the space of, uh, let's say, uh, the conformal manifold from uh, these properties that it's a section of L times L star and these kind of things. So global properties were recently studied in two very nice papers. When I say very nice, it means it's not my own papers. Uh, it's 07366. So there were two papers recently addressing some global issues. Uh, this is on the physics side, and on the mathematics side, there was uh, some very nice work by Donaghy, Morrison, uh, whose number I forgot to copy. So these are like the physics uh, on the physics side, and this is on the mass, mass uh, side. Now, this also in this paper, now there is a lot of, uh, there, there was quite a bit of work about the resurgence properties of these uh, perturbative expansions. Uh, you can find some, uh, of some of, one of the first papers is this, and you can look at the follow-ups if you want to see more recent developments. This is one of the first uh, papers on the subject. Then, uh, these extremal correlators, they have like a limit where the dimension is very large. This is when this little n goes to, this is, well, so when this little n goes to infinity, these extremal correlators describe correlation functions of very, very heavy operators. So this limit of very heavy operators uh, has to do with the large charge expansion of Hellermann et al. So, so that, that's some, that is some story in effective field theory. But since here there are exact results, uh, you can make some useful comparisons be be between those two approaches. And you can read about that stuff in uh, some recent papers that I'm quoting here. So these are like the most important papers to read at the moment. And then there is a topic of, next, of the next lecture, which is TT star geometry. Toda, chains, Toda chains and integrability. These uh, topics arise when we study these extremal correlators uh, of heavy operators. And that has been uh, first initiated in 2009. And well, there was a lot of work since. I'm just quoting some of the papers that are relevant. And there are more and more, I'm just quoting a few. And there are more and more papers about this. And also, everything I'm saying has an analog in two dimensions. Also, in two dimensions, you get interesting dependence on various coupling constants, on the complex structure moduli of calabi yau manifolds. That's the subject uh, in and of itself. And this has been recently, uh, there were two papers that came out almost at the same time about the two-dimensional analog of all this story. And I presume there is much more to do there. And in fact, this paper is uh, by you, right? So he's a, hmm? I mean the second one. Second one? No, the, the 
What? No, I mean at the number, the second number. Not the first one. Oh, that's right. Yes, 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 yes. You're right. This is yours. Yeah. Okay. We can uh, take a break now. <laughs>